Amen. Well, good evening. Glad you're here tonight and uh, excited about worshiping the Lord together. Let's start with a word of prayer. And uh, Brother Chris, would you mind opening some prayer this evening? Amen. You may be seated. And let's continue worshiping this evening as we look at the victory and promise of heaven. Page 607, let's stand together. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. What a great thing we can look forward to. Page 607, when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that third together. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, Men, if you would come, we'll take this evening's tithes and offerings. And Brother Pat, it's good to have you back in town. Would you mind praying for our offering tonight? Amen. 
stand. You may be seated. Well, just a couple of reminders for you. Tomorrow night, uh, we're going to have a work day here at the church and try to get some projects done. And uh, kind of all over the place, we're going to try to clean the gym carpets, get the kitchen back in shape. We're going to try to, uh, really the main project is this welcome center. And we're going to open that wall up a little bit and try to make that a place where we can uh, make visitors feel welcome, I guess. And uh, uh, so if you're able to help, we'll be here at 630 and uh, try to get that done in a couple hours, all the projects. And so that'll be tomorrow night. All right. And then our senior saints, they are going to go to William Reds on Thursday, October 26. And uh, if you want to ride the church bus or caravan over with us, we'll meet here at 5 o'clock. Uh, if not, you can meet us over there, and we're usually there around 5.30, uh, if that gives you an idea of, uh, of timing for that night. And uh, if you could sign up, whether you're coming on the bus or not, uh, that way we can reserve uh, seating and, and get the room we need. And so that's on the back table, okay? And then uh, I think anyone involved with this knows this already, but this coming weekend is our couples retreat up in Shipshawana. And I appreciate Pat so much putting that together. A lot of work goes into that behind the scenes. And so be praying for that this week. If you're not able to go, uh, that'll use, God will use that to strengthen our families and our marriages. And so that'll be this weekend, uh, Friday through Saturday. Okay. And then finally, reminder that uh, we have bus visitation on Saturdays right now at 1030. And that just meets here at the church, and Brian and Hillary head that up. And uh, any questions on that, see them. And uh, they're doing a good job reaching out to young people and getting them here, especially on uh, Master Club nights. Now that that's going, uh, that's been a great ministry. So appreciate that very much. All right. Well, I believe that is all we have. So, Pastor Joey, if you'd come, lead us one more song. You can remain seated for our final song this evening, page 603, 603 in the suite by and by. And there's lots of great things to look forward to about heaven. There's loved ones we'll see again. There's perfectness. There's no sin or, or anything like that. But what the scripture says is the best part about heaven is that we will be with our Father. And as we look at this song, the, the thing that we're looking forward to is that the Father waits over the way so that we can one day be with our Lord and Savior. Let's sing together, page 603, in the sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling. On that third together. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tributes of praise, for the glory is gift of his love, and the blessings that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. On that beautiful shore. It's 
little flower that opens, each little bird that sings. God made their glowing colors. He made their tiny wings. Yes, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, and all things wise and wonderful. trees in the green wood, the meadows where we play, the grass in the water we gather every day. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell the goodness of the Father who do with all things well. Yes, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, and all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Now that was awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> Kinsley, if I were you, I'd make Papaw get you some ice cream after that tonight. That was good. Hey, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 10? Mark chapter 10. And uh, we're going through our series verse by verse, kind of through the book of Mark. And uh, we're in chapter 10 tonight, and it's on marriage. And it's uh, an interesting passage. And so we'll be in Mark chapter 10, and we'll do verses 1 through 12 uh, as we look at that section tonight. It says this in verse 1, And he arose from thence, and cometh to the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. Now take that location and put it in your hip pocket. We're going to need to pull that out here in a minute. And the people resort unto him again, and he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put, his way, put away his wife, or, or to divorce her, is what he's saying, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? So he steers on back to Scripture. He says, Well, what does the Scripture say? And these Pharisees, they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote this precept. But from the beginning of creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again and of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll walk our way through our passage tonight. Lord, we thank you uh, for your God-given gift of marriage. And I pray that as we walk through this passage, that tonight we would be encouraged, that we would be challenged. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would give us clarity. It, it's kind of a tough passage. And I pray that we would walk out here from here tonight with your mind on the matter and your un understanding of what it is that you desire for marriages. And uh, we thank you for it. I pray that you'll be with us tonight. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Well, how many of you have been married at least five years? Anybody been married 10 years? 20 years? 
All right, 25. 30. 40. Anybody been 40? 50? Wow, okay, 55. 60? Royce, how long have you guys been married? 60 years. She's put up with you that long. That's pretty good. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, uh, whether you've been married a year or five years or 60 years, uh, there's something funny about husband-wife relationships, and, and uh, it's almost like we speak different languages at times. Would you agree with that? And, and ladies, I'm going to give you some thoughts here, and uh, you may want to write these down. These are, these are translations, all right? So when a guy says these things, these are what he actually means. So when a guy says it's a guy thing, what he really means is this. There is no logical explanation for what I'm about to do, so please stop asking me. That's what he means. If a guy says it would take too long to explain, what he really means is, I have no idea how that works. <laughs> if a husband says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, what he's really saying is this, you're making too much noise and I can't hear the game on the television. That's what he means. When a husband says, you know how bad my memory is, what he's saying is this. He's saying, despite the fact that I know all the lyrics to the Beverly Hillbillies, I'm sorry I forgot your birthday. That's what, he's, <laughs> that's what he means. When a husband says, I can't find it, he means, unless it falls into my outstretched hand, I am completely clueless. Anybody else, your marriages are like that? My care, she'll say, well, it's right there. And I will go and I will stare right at it. And I'll say, it is not here. And she will come and pick it up and put it in my hand. And I'll say, thank you, you know. <laughs> When a husband says, you look terrific, what he's really saying is this, stop changing your outfit and let's go. That's what he's saying. And when a husband says, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are, what he's really saying is, no one will ever see us alive again. That's what a husband's <laughs> saying. Well, marriage is a funny thing. I, I heard about one guy who was at the Super Bowl and he had an empty seat next to him at the Super Bowl and a, a stranger came up to him and said, he said, you really have an empty seat at the Super Bowl? No one's sitting with you? And he said, well, it was my wife's, and she passed away, and, and uh, uh, no one else came. And uh, the guy said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, uh, uh, but I think surely one of your friends or family members would want to come and, and at least be here. And he said, yeah, I don't get it either. They, they all wanted to go to the funeral. So, <laughs> <laughs> No? Too far? Too far? <laughs> Well, tonight we're going to talk about marriage, and marriage, it's, uh, it's a funny thing, but I tell you, it is something that is very precious to the heart of God. If you go back to the beginning of Scripture, it is God who ordained marriage. God, marriage is God's idea, and God has a design for how marriage is supposed to work. And Jesus, he talks about marriage as we get into Mark chapter 10, and Jesus, uh, as he's talking about it, the reason he's talking about it is because the Pharisees have come to him again. They, they have come with what they think is another scheme, and they're going to trap Jesus in this question. And, and they try to put Jesus in a pickle and, and put him in a no-win situation. And so what they do is they come to Jesus, they ask him this, quish, this question. They say, uh, they say, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? They take the topic of divorce, and they, they try to use it to put Jesus in a, a very tight corner. And Jesus, he... he, he looks at the situation and with the wisdom that he always has he has the perfect answer for it they, they thought they could use this topic as a a leverage point on christ and and it was a tough topic for christ to talk about for a couple of reasons and really they're the same reasons they're tough to talk about today because one reason is it is a painful topic you, you talk about the topic of divorce and and uh my guess would be there's not a single person in this room who has not been hurt by that area, whether personally or someone you love, uh, maybe a parent or, or a family member, uh, your, your heart just breaks for them and breaks with them. We just recently found out uh, a couple months ago that one of our good friends from, from uh, college got divorced. It's just a, a gut punch. You know how that is. And so it's a very painful topic, and, and they thought they could leverage that to, to attack Christ. And it's also a, a very polarizing topic. Uh, good godly men that have thoroughly studied scripture have studied this topic and, and honestly have landed in different places when it comes to different areas on this. And, and they brought this to Christ and their whole reason was to use this tough topic to undermine Christ, to, to alienate him from those that would follow him. And they were trying to use this as a, a tactic against Christ. 
And I love how Jesus responds. Christ, he answers the question, he is very clear, but at the same time, he is very compassionate. He, he doesn't uh, skirt the issue, he doesn't beat around the bush, he's very clear, but at the same time, he's very compassionate. And by the time you walk away from this passage, you, you have no doubt that God is for marriages, and he is for families, and, and he, is, he is a champion of marriages. And uh, tonight we, we come to it, and honestly, it's, it's not a passage that you would just pick out to preach. But if we are going to study Scripture, we are going to study all of Scripture, amen. And when we get to a tough passage, we're not going to uh, go around it. We, we want to be a church that hears God's voice on what he has to say, amen. amen. And so we'll look at it tonight, and, and uh, my, my hope is, my prayer is, that, that by the time we get through this, that God's heart will come through. That, that God is for you, he is for your family, he is for your marriage, and, and I hope that is seen through it tonight. So the Pharisees, they come and they ask Jesus the question, is it lawful for a man to put away or divorce his wife? Now it's interesting, you remember at the very first verse, I, I told you to, to hide something away, and that was the location that Jesus was in. He is in the coast of Judea by the farther side of of Jordan. You say, well, well, why is that important? Well, it's important because that is the territory of Herod. It is the place where John the Baptist had been executed. He had been beheaded. Do you remember why John the Baptist was beheaded? It's because he had spoken out against Herod's uh, wrongful divorce. And because of that, he got executed for it. And no doubt, these Pharisees, they, they know the situation. And they would just be thrilled if that same fate would fall on Christ. And so in this region, under Herod's uh, jurisdiction, they, they bring up the question again. And they're, they're hoping that, that it'll get some conflict. And, and I love Christ's response. Look what Christ says. His response in verse 3 is this. What did Moses command you? So what does Christ do? He does what we should always do. And he says, he says look back at the authority of Scripture. What is it that God has said on this topic? And what they were trying to do is, is they were trying to polarize him. And I, I, I want to give you just three statements tonight that can kind of help us uh, summarize this passage. The first one I want to give you is this. As we look at the passage, we see that the Pharisees were concerned about the technicalities of divorce. But Jesus was concerned about the institution of marriage. The Pharisees were concerned about the technicalities of divorce, but Jesus was concerned about the institution of marriage. Back in Jesus' day, there were two categories of teachings. There were, there were two different rabbis or teachers. One teacher was the name of Rabbi Shammai, and, and he was the conservative when it came to the teachers. And he said that divorce is, is never lawful under any circumstances. And he, 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 was, he was ultimately cons conservative. And the other side, there was this rabbi, Rabbi Hamel, who had died about 20 years before this conversation is happening, and and he had taught, and what the most of the population believed was that you could pretty much get a divorce for anything. Here's a list of some of the things he said that you could get a divorce for. He said a husband could divorce his wife if she went outside with her head uncovered. He could divorce his wife if she was quarrelsome. He could divorce his wife if she was childless or if she found, he found her speaking to another man on the street. He could divorce her, his wife if she said anything negative about her mother-in-law. Good luck with that one, folks. <laughs> I'm, I'm off to a rough start tonight, aren't I? Let me just soften it up here. If he found another woman that was more attractive, uh, if he burnt the dinner, or if she put too much salt on his food. All these things were reasons back then that, that this teaching said you could get a divorce for pretty much any reason. And what the other one said is you can never get a divorce for any reason. And, and what they were trying to do was they were trying to make Christ pick a side. And whichever side he picked, he was going to alienate the opposing side. And so what Christ does is he does not take the bait. Instead of debating the technicalities of divorce, what Christ does is he begins to talk about God's ideal for marriage. Let's look at that. In verse 6, he says this. He says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, 
let no man put asunder. What Christ does is he begins to lay out what God's ideal for marriage is. I want you to see a few thoughts here from this section. First of all, I want you to see that, that Jesus, in verse 6, he shows us the design for marriage. The design for marriage. He says in verse 6, he says, but from the beginning. Now, it's interesting. God's plan for marriage has never changed. Have you noticed that? If you read these verses and they sound familiar, the reason is because they are quotations from the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, God's plan for marriage, he laid it out. And between Genesis 1 and between the life of Christ, God's plan for what marriage should be never changed. And the time between the life of Christ and today, God's plan for marriage has not changed. Amen. He lays out what that plan is. He lays it out and he says that, that God's plan for marriage is this, that from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, I tell you, that this will not be politically correct, and it's not very popular, but God's plan for marriage is the fact that it is one man and one woman for one lifetime. And I tell you, that, that's under attack in our world today, and people don't want to hear that, and, and they get upset if you say that, but, but the truth is, that is God's plan. It has always been God's plan, and God hasn't changed his mind on it. I have a good friend from, from college, and uh, we were at Bible college. He was way smarter than I was, got much better grades in, in all the Bible classes and that sort of thing. And, and after graduation, he, he, he chose to go into a homosexual lifestyle. And now you talk to him, and, and he takes Scripture, and he'll, he'll try to excuse this and, and to bend that and, and to say, well, God's really okay with it. And, and there are some denominations that say the same thing, but... But I, I got to tell you, you look at scripture, he says, from the beginning, God's plan was one man with one woman for one lifetime, and, and that plan has not changed. He shows the design for marriage. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He shows us that in, in verse 6. We see the design for marriage. And then after that, we see the duty of marriage. Would you look at verse 7? He talks us through what, what marriage is supposed to look like. What is the pattern for marriage? He says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. He says, and the twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Here he lays out the duty of marriage. What are we supposed to do? What is marriage supposed to look like? Well, you see a few phrases there. He says, first of all, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. First of all, marriage is a time of transition. For the first time, when uh, a young man gets married, his mom is no longer the most important woman in his life. And uh, I'm, I'm getting some glares from some moms right there, all right? And uh, the truth is, when you get married, your spouse is to be your most important human relationship amen it's no longer your buddies from high school it's no longer your co-workers it's it's not even your children your your most important relationship is with your spouse he says you will leave your father and your mother and the truth is our spouses they should know that they are the most important person in our lives amen they, they should know how important they are i read a story about an author. He lived over in England. His name was uh, Thomas Carlyle. He, he lived on a little farm in a little village, and he called his house the loneliest nook in Britain. And this man, every day, he would climb a ladder up into his attic. He would write all day, and then at bedtime, he would turn in, and he would never say a kind word to his wife about anything. His wife, by the name of Jane, finally one night over dinner asked him the question. She said, she said, why is it you never express any appreciation or never show any love to me? And his response was this, word for word. He says, woman, must you be paid for everything you do? And with that, he stomped off up into the attic and, and continued his work. He said years later, his wife passed away and he found her diary. And as he opened it, there were tear-stained pages and and here was the refrain that recurred over and over in her diary. She said this. She said, oh, I would you would say a kind word or give me a compliment now and then about the things I try to do to make you happy. Husbands, does your wife know 
how important she is to you? Wives, does your husband know that, that he is still the same priority now as he was when you first got married? It's a time of transition. It's a time where a new relationship is formed, and it is the, the highest priority of all human relationships here on this earth. It's a time of transition. It's, it's also a model. Work, work with me here. Where is it that the groom comes from? Who is he leaving? You see it right there. Who is the husband leaving before he starts this new marriage? His father and his mother, correct? Now, if you were to look the verse before, well, what has he said? He had said God's design for marriage is that uh, it would be one man and one woman for one lifetime. So, so get this here. As this husband starts his new family, he is ideally coming from a family that has already modeled Christ's design. Parents, I just want to remind you that, that as you live out your marriage, you are also showing your children what marriage is supposed to look like. Uh, Dad, when you interact with your wife, you are showing your son how he is someday supposed to treat his wife. Uh, when, when you interact with your wife, you are showing your daughter the kind of man she is to look for when she gets married, or, or showing her what to expect on how she should be treated when she gets older. It is a model. It, it, is, it is this groom who, as he is starting his new family, he is coming from a family that has already modeled God's design. He says, the, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and then, he says, and cleave to his wife. The, the word cleave there is the idea to, to have a bond that cannot be broken. It's, uh, uh, literally, it's the idea of super glue. When it says cleave there, it has that concept. When I was in high school, we went to camp one week, and, and uh, me and my buddy, we, we were just bored. There wasn't a whole lot of activities to do. And so, so what we did is, is one of us had brought super glue with us, and uh, our, our game for the week is we took a quarter and we would put it in some high profile location, right on a step or a bench or something like that. And we would, we would super glue it to the, to the bench and put it there. And the game was to see how many people we could try to get to try to pick up that quarter. And it was, it was fun. I'm thinking about doing it to our ushers in the offering plates just to, <laughs> to see what we can get there. And you couldn't pick it up because it was stuck. That's the word cleave. And in a non-romantic sense, he says that, that when you're married, you are stuck to the other person. You, you, you are stuck with them. You cannot leave them. You cleave to them, is what he says. That word cleave is the idea of stuck, but it is also the idea of pursuing. It's the inherent to the idea of pursuing after someone. Do you remember, ladies, when your husband first started dating you and how he pursued you? Do you remember that? Do you remember how he, he, he tried to woo you and to, 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 to get you into that relationship? That's the word here. And so literally when he says cleave, what he's saying is this. He's saying two people that are stuck together because they are pursuing hard after one another. That's a good definition. Now that's what marriage should be. It should be two people that are pursuing hard after one another. He says, and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What he's saying is this. Marriage, it takes two lives and it brings them together and makes them one. It's the, the idea of intimacy in marriage. And you say, well, it's talking about physical intimacy. Well, that's probably involved in this too, but it's much more than that. It's the idea of, uh, of two people having oneness in mind and in spirit and in goals and directions and, and, and will. It's the idea of unity. It's oneness. They, too, shall be one flesh. It's two lives coming together. And, and what God does in marriage is God takes two lives and he brings them together. Uh, that is why both death and divorce are so painful, because it is the the separating of two lives that had been brought together. Uh, I was uh, impressed by your grandma this week, Brittany. Brittany's uh, grandpa passed away, and uh, him and, his, and your grandma had been married 65 years. They, they had met when she was, I think, 16. He was 18, and together all those years, and, and, and said goodbye to him this week. And I tell you, 
There's no other way to say that except that's hard. Uh, That's a painful thing to be together that long and then to say goodbye to the one that you've been with that long. Why? Because you have become one. God has brought those lives together. And so he shows us, he shows us the, the, the duty of marriage. What does it look like? He says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. And then in verse 9, I want us to see the duration of marriage. He says, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. What he is doing here is he is describing the ideal marriage. He is describing what what God's ideal plan for marriage was. And, And what he says is this, he is saying, God is the one who makes the marriage. And uh, when, when a marriage happens, it is not just a covenant between those two people, but it is a covenant between them and the Lord. Uh, that's why sometimes one of the things you see today at weddings is the, uh, the three braids. Have you seen that? And they'll braid it together. What are they symbolizing? They are symbolizing the fact that, that they, too, are entering a covenant with themselves and with God. He is saying that God is the one who brings two lives together. I am the one who makes marriages. And what he is saying is he, he says, do not take apart what I have put together. He's saying when you break up a marriage, you either yours or someone else's, you are tampering with the work of an almighty God. And so what God does is God defines marriage as it is a covenant between one man and one woman for one lifetime. The commitment there, the, the duration of marriage. I've, I've told Karis, I've decided if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. That's just how it's going to be. Because, <laughs> first of all, I wouldn't survive without her, you know. I, I, like what, uh, I like what Henry Ford said. Henry Ford, on his 50th birthday, someone asked him, he said, they said, what's the, what's the secret to, to, to having such a longevity in your marriage? And Henry Ford's answer was this. He said, the formula is the same formula I've always used in making cars. Just stick to one model. That's pretty good advice right there. I liked Ruth Graham's advice. Ruth Graham, someone asked her, she, that would be Billy Graham's wife, and, and said, uh, Ruth, have you ever considered divorce? And her response was, no, never divorce. Murder, yes. Divorce, no. <laughs> you look at this, and you, you look at this passage, and what is it? It is God's ideal for marriage. Th- this is what his plan was for the beginning. One man with one woman for one lifetime to cleave to one another, to love one another, to make their lives one and unified with one another. That is God's plan. That is his desire. But, but I also recognize we live in a world that is not an ideal world. And, and you look at that and you look at this topic and you say, so, so, so what, if, what if life has not been ideal to this point? Well, uh, let's keep going. Let me, let me show you the second point I see here. And, and number two would be this. The Pharisees confused Moses's provision as a command. Jesus clarified Moses' command as a concession. The Pharisees confused Moses' provision as a command. Jesus clarified Moses' command as a concession. So look at verse four. Uh, I'm sorry, let's look at verse three. They, they ask him, is it lawful? And, and in verse three, he says unto them, what did Moses command you? And they say, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Christ answers, says this. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Now that's an interesting question the Pharisees asked. The the question they asked about divorce was, was more a question that seemed to be about what one could get away with under the law as opposed to what was intended by the law. And Christ, he, he flipped that on its head. And he says, you're, you're asking the wrong question. He says, you're, you're asking the question, what, what can I get away with under the law? And, and Christ says, well, let me just show you what the ideal of the law was. And that's what we just walked through. And what he says was this. He said, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. It seems to be that there are certain biblical grounds for divorce. Uh, adultery, for sure. You look at Matthew 19 and and how that is the same story we're looking at now, and they don't contradict each other, they complement each other. You look over in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 7, and, and when you're married to an unbelieving spouse that, that wants to walk away, you are to let them go. And, 
And so there are biblical grounds for, for divorce. And, and really, this is, like I said earlier, this is where it gets very polarizing and different opinions. And, and, and what does it mean when you can have divorce? Is that for an emotional unfaithfulness or physical unfaithfulness or, or for a one-time act, for an ongoing act? And, and just all these debates about it. But what I, I want us to see tonight is this. Divorce, even on biblical grounds, God says it was not a command, but it was a concession by God. Well, what he's saying is this. Even when there is ground for biblical divorce, he's saying that the first heartbeat needs to be, what can we do to restore that marriage? He, he's saying, what he's saying is this. He's saying, I am being a champion for marriages. And you're looking at the, the details saying, well, well what, what allows me to have a divorce? And Christ is saying, you, you need to see the heartbeat is is this is God's ideal, and, and you need to pursue that with everything you can. But then he says, even with that in mind, we live in a sin-sick world, and we are sin-sick people, and we marry sin-sick people. And so sometimes divorce is going to happen. Divorce is a reality in our world. I saw a statistic that 80% of divorces are unilateral, meaning that one of the spouses did not want it to take place. And Jesus, or God, because of that, he made this concession of divorce. And what they're referencing here is actually in Deuteronomy 24. And, and if you go back and study that out, what God is doing is he was actually giving this as an act of compassion to the folks in the Old Testament. You see, the hardness of their hearts, men were taking women and they were, they were divorcing them and then remarrying another and, and almost treating these women like commodities. And what what god was doing was he was putting parameters around divorce and saying uh, i'm going to make a way for this woman to have a uh, 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 respectable life after divorce what, what is he doing he, he is making a way for life after divorce that's what he's saying you, you say you say brian uh, boil it down what, what are you saying what i'm saying is this even if your past has not been ideal that does not mean that today you cannot model God's ideal for your family today. Are you with me? Are, 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 are we connected at all? He, what God is saying is he's saying, I gave this as a way for life to move on when life isn't ideal. And you may not be able to unscramble the eggs of your past, and, and you may not be able to change things, but today, God is for your family today. And God is for your marriage today, and you can model what God wants you to model in your family today. Are you, are you with me? Am, 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 am I alone up here? You're, you're with me? All right. What he's saying is this. He's saying, he's clarifying this command. And really that clarification is he is just saying, I am for you. I am for your family. I am for your marriage. I am for your future, even if your past has not been ideal. That's what he's saying. And then third of all, I want us to see this. The Pharisees took marriage lightly, and Jesus took marriage seriously. The Pharisees took marriage lightly, Jesus took marriage seriously. He says in verse 10, And in the house of the disciples asked him again of the same manner, and he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his life, his wife, and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. What Jesus is showing here is how seriously he takes marriage. The, the Pharisees, they had a casual approach to marriage, and, and they weren't the only ones. In fact, if you look at this same passage over in Matthew, the, the disciples, after all this, they came to Christ, and you remember what they asked them? They said, Christ, if you're taking this marriage thing this seriously, and you're going to be stuck with this woman for the rest of your life, they said, this is what they said, they said, wouldn't it be better just not to get married? <laughs> that, was their, that was their conclusion. And uh, what, what Christ is saying is this. He is saying, I want you to see how serious I take marriage. I want you to see what a priority it is. I want you to see how much, how much attention you need to give to it because it, it is a reflection of my relationship to my people. The, the marriage relationship, it is to reflect the relationship of God to his people. And so that same love and that same sacrifice and that same care and that same unity, he says that is a visual of me with my church. The church is my bride. And he takes it very seriously. We come to the book of Mark and, and we come to this passage and, and uh, really what Christ has laid out for us is a pattern of what marriage should be. When uh, I was younger, I would take a, 
piece of computer paper or something like that and, and find a really cool picture and I'd lay it on top and I would cheat and I would just trace that thing and then go around and show people and impress them how, how good a drawler I'm at. Anybody else ever do that? Really what Mark 10 is, you can come to that little section of verses and you can take your marriage and, and you lay it on top of it and you can trace it and it can be a model of what your marriage and what your family needs to be like today. I don't know what the past is. I don't know what may have happened back then, but today you can model God's best for today, amen? And you can be faithful today. And we look at this and we see that, and, and this is God's ideal for the home. God is for the home. God is for the marriage. God is for your family. And God has laid out how life is supposed to work. You know, I, I, I've done several weddings, I'm getting ready to do another one this coming week, and and I have never had anyone come to me and say, you know, Pastor Brian, we want to get married because uh, we just want to be miserable till death do us part. I never had that. But I tell you what, the only way to have a truly happy and joyful home is when it's done God's way. And when you come to Mark 10, he shows us how to do the home God's way. And so it's a pattern for us. It's a, a picture that we can lay our families on, our marriage is on, and we can emulate, we can reflect the model that God has for us. Amen? Heads bowed and eyes closed. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for tonight. And Lord, I thank you for our, our folks. And I, uh, I know this isn't an easy passage, but I thank you for their hearts. I thank you for uh, meeting with us tonight, Lord. And I pray that you would be with our families here tonight. I pray that you'd be with our marriages, that you would strengthen them. Lord, they, they are under attack in our world. They are being challenged on every front. And, uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would help us as a church to, to fight for our families, to fight for our marriages, to be encouragers, to be uh, champions for the families in our church, Lord. And I pray that as we go out from here that uh, we would model what you have laid out for us in this passage. We thank you for all you've done. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? We'll turn to hymn number 579. Hymn 579, as we sing together, hymn 579. God has built his church on one foundation. Jesus Christ, the living cornerstone, crucified and risen to redeem us. We adore and worship Him alone. We are your church, your pride, the people of your name. In your strength we live. We worship unashamed for your cause we serve. We joyfully proclaim we are your people. We are your church. I appreciate you being here tonight, and we'll dismiss with a word of prayer. Brother Pat, would you mind closing us in prayer tonight?